Uh, good to see everyone in person uh, after getting to know you online. And uh, as you can imagine, it might take a few classes for me to be able to identify you without the help of, uh, of Zoom. Right? We are not a big class, so but just ask you to, when you ask a question, just say your name right? so that uh, we get to know each other. We have, uh, we're going to be starting in a couple of minutes. Okay, you take control. Oh. <laughs> There's a short introductory video here before we get started formally. Okay. Well, you've seen this video before. So while our audience uh, is waiting for us to get started, uh, it's a great pleasure to have our speakers here. I'm going to introduce them in a couple of minutes. This is one of the most popular topics for the semester, and it can be because a lot. I'm Sydney, don't forget to unmute the lecture hall. Anna, can you hear us now? Yes. Excellent. So have you started the video? I have you shown the video already? Yes. Okay, so we are live now to the world. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, live on YouTube. Excellent. No, well, thanks so much. Good evening, everyone. So, for those of you who are following us on YouTube, and especially for those of you who are in the classroom, it's good to be back and meet in person here yeah, for the students who are joining our course. The first two sessions we had them online. Now we're going back to our normal activities, and uh, I'm sure that uh, the students are appreciating the opportunity to interact with each other in a more uh, normal setting. And uh, we're glad to have a very uh, special discussion today, not only because we are having as a speaker, one of the foremost uh, uh, experts on the topic of inequality. I'm gonna introduce our speaker uh, in a moment. And we also have a very special participation of a visiting scholar who will be uh, providing comments before we get uh, into the q &A part of the session. Right? So uh, traditionally, the way that we do this is that for the first part of our class, we have a presentation followed by comments. And uh, the second part, which is closed to participants, so only the students will be joining us, uh, we have a more open conversation where uh, the students are, are encouraged to actually participate. Uh, I told the students that we're going to be discussing some internal issues in the second part. So um, we are uh, right now starting with uh, the, our the introductions. And it's my great pleasure to introduce Professor Marcelo Medeiros, who is a professor here at SIPA. Uh, previously, he also taught at uh, several uh, leading academic institutions, including Yale, Berkeley, Sophia University, and Princeton. Uh, as I mentioned, he is one of the foremost um, uh, thought leaders on the study of inequality. Uh, he, he has a training in economics and sociology, and uh, he's been here with SIPA for, uh, since last year, Professor. 
uh, it's a great pleasure to have him. Uh, he's also a researcher at IPEA, Brazil's uh, uh, think tank devoted to uh, several issues that we're going to be discussing today. And with us, it's a great pleasure to have a visiting scholar uh, here, uh, Andrea Carvalhal, who is a professor at the Federal University of Rio de Janeiro and also head of investment at the National Development Bank. And the reason that I invited Carvalhal to join us it is because Marcelo is going to be talking about, uh, about the issue of inequality from a policy perspective. And we also wanted to bring the institutional perspective. How do you, once you identify the problems and you come up with the policy pres prescriptions, uh, how do you tackle them uh, from an institutional standpoint? Uh, for those of you who don't know, the National Development Bank has an acronym in Portuguese, it's BNDS, and S stands for social. So the, there's a mandate to, to address a lot of the issues that uh, are part of our today's conversation. So, Without further ado, let me hand over to Marcelo, and uh, we're expecting a, a great and very interactive uh, discussion today. I'm not sure I'm going to meet your expectations, but I, I was preceded in this seminar by Professor Fischl, and he was possibly um, cited by Professor Hoffman, the, one of the most including, most important specialists in the quality in Brazil. He wrote, wrote one of the most important papers on the quality in Brazil back in the 1970s. And I feel that uh, you know, there, it's a burden to me to, to be here because, like, you know, when you proceed by someone like him, like, what am I going to do? So I was thinking, of course, not to focus on the long term. I was thinking about focusing on the, in the short run, in the short term. And so what, what I want to talk about, you know, more general issues regarding inequality in Brazil, what we know, and what we know about policies that can reduce inequality. That's, that's you know, which means I'm, I'm more kind of interested in the practical solutions that you can have to address uh, the problem of high levels of, of inequality in Brazil. And most of the things I'm going to say here also would apply to all the Latin American countries, maybe most developing countries, but Latin American countries in general um, have a profile that are sufficiently sufficiently similar to that of the Brazilian inequality. So we can, to some extent, extrapolate, of course, to be careful doing those extrapolations. But uh, most of what I'm going to say here is all, also applies to other countries in the region, especially in the southern core. Um, and uh, when we talk about inequality, we talk about the inequality of something and among someone, you know, some specific group, which in this case, I would be talking about income inequality among persons. We're talking about different types of inequality. For instance, we could be talking about educational inequalities among regions, and that's a different type of inequality. The one I'm gonna focus here is income inequality among persons, which means I am speaking about a limited, uh, I have a limited scope in what I am saying here. And I would begin, I would, I would like to begin being very clear on this because there's a lot of things that are gonna be say out of my discussion here. Uh, but I don't want to, to neglect those important inequalities as well. So just keep that in mind. If you are to describe the distribution of incomes in Brazil, uh, in my opinion, the best way of making that description is to describe it as a very large mass of people with low income separated from a small but rich elite. And that description is very important because it has um, some uh, implications. The very large mass of people of low income is a mass of people that is very homogeneous, very low levels of inequality in that mass. For instance, if you just line up all the adults, you, know, you rank them by income and you line them up, the difference between the adult on the first third of the population, the income of the adult on the first third, uh, third of the population, and the one in the second third of the population is only twice, only two times. Meaning that you know, a person, the 66% of the population is only twice richer than the person at the 33rd. Uh, 33 percent of the population and that is same to say as if Brazil was a country that didn't have the top 10 percent of its population it would be a very equal country it wouldn't be an equal 
On the other hand, most of the inequality is within the top. Actually, most of the inequality in Brazil is the difference between the rich and the rest and the inequality within the rich. The top 10%, maybe the main rich, whatever you wish. I'm not going to dispute terms here. Uh, I want to go through the input here. It's very simple. The top 10%, on the other hand, is very unequal. There's a lot of inequality. If the top 10% of the, of the Brazil was it a separate country, it would be a very unequal country, which means that we're discussing two different things. One is a very homogeneous population with little differentiation in sight, and one very heterogeneous but rich population. And we have to keep that in mind when we design policy. That's, that's, this is the first argument I would like to sustain here. We have to keep that in mind when we design any type of policy, any type of policy. Like we design a pension reform, we should keep that in mind. A labor reform, we should keep that in mind. Name it, educational policies, we should keep that in mind as well. You should always keep those that that type of inequality in mind. And this uh, has two immediate implications. The first one is that when we discuss the division of the population into classes. It is not wise to subdivide this large mass of population in many classes, such as like, let's divide the population in, in, in quarters or maybe in, in five groups, you know, 20, each 20% 20 forms a group. That is not a very wise decision because you're compounding classes separating people that are actually very similar within those classes. Now, the first 20% are very different, but the second 20%, the third 20%, the fourth 20% are very similar. And it's simply dividing artificially those groups in, into separate classes. On the other hand, the last 20% that you treat as a single group is actually a very heterogeneous group. So if you want to divide the society in classes, you should divide the classes at the top. Just keep large classes at the bottom and divide classes at the top. So, well, but this is merely technical. Just concerned about defining the population class. No, it isn't. It isn't because policy is designed with the typical groups in mind. We don't design policies in terms of, okay, let's calculate where the individual position, uh, where an individual is in the entire distribution of income. We de define policies in very abstract terms. We want to take care of the poor. We want to take care of the workers. We want to take care of the those in need, of the vulnerable. Just name it, without specifying that very clearly. And what I'm arguing here is that the definition of classes in large shares of population that are very homogeneous is a mistake because it mixes, it separates people that should be mixed up. On the other hand, it, se it mixes people at the top, people who should be separated because they're not equal. They're not. They're very different. They're sufficiently different to be treated differently. That's the idea. Why am I saying this? Well, this has very direct, very important direct implications. For instance, should we be targeting our policies? We do target because we need, you know, we don't have an infinite budget, so we do have restrictions in terms of money, but should we be targeting? If we target, should we be simply saying yes or no to populate the people? Like you are, you're not poor anymore, you build you're both the poverty line, so you get nothing. Should we be doing this? And the answer I give you is no, we shouldn't, because that's not the way that income is distributed. The way that income is distributed implies that some people are going to need more help, some people are going to need less help, but it's still, there's a huge amount of people, a huge mass of people needing to some extent depend that depend on the state in many things, depend on the state for health services, depend on the state for educational services, name it. Make a list and probably you're going to find like 60, maybe 70 percent of your population depends heavily on the public provision of all types of services. That's one, one. Those are two primary implications. And that has to do with the distribution. Let me talk a little bit about the concentration because also this is an important information. Because of this distribution, income is highly concentrated. It is highly, if you want to. Like, when I have a rule of thumb for this, is 
it's, it's 50 in five, which means that 50% of all income in the country, half of the all income in the country is in the hands of 5% of the population. That's it, you know, it's easier to keep those numbers in mind. And actually, about one quarter of all income is on the hand of 1% of your population. Top 1% controls uh, one quarter of uh, all income. The top 10% controls over 60% of the income. This also has important implications. The first implication is that since you have like 50% of the income in the hands of 5% of the population, 25% on the hands of 1% of the population, almost anything that you mention in the economy has to do with the elites. Like Brazil has a problem of low productivity. Yes, it does. And actually the full sentence is the Brazilian elites that control most of the Brazilian income have a problem of productivity. The product of productivity is located on those who actually have the money. And they're not producing enough. And I'm not saying that the, the bottom of the population uh, have a problem, uh, doesn't have a problem with productivity. Of course, they do. But the thing is that if you double the productivity of the 50, you know, of two thirds of the population of Brazil, nothing is going to happen to the GDP. The variation is going to be minimal if you double, if you triple. On the other hand, if you increase the productivity of the top 1% of the population, then you're going to move the GDP up and down. And this is an important information because uh, when we discuss growth policies, when you know growth is always a subject that comes into discussion of economic policies, when we're discussing growth policies, actually we are discussing something that is going to be highly appropriated by the top one percent of the population. Like in between two thousand six and two thousand twelve. The top one percent of the population accumulated 33 zero percent of all growth in Brazil. And you, you can also make the same calculations for the global distribution of incomes, and you're gonna find similar results. Which means that when we're talking about growth, we're not talking about growth of the country as an abstract institution, an abstract organization. We're talking about the growth of someone, and that someone is. When we discuss growth policies, we're going to discuss something that is going to be to be, is going to be appropriated by the top, but going to be appropriated by the elites. One third of all growth is going to be appropriated by, say, 25, 30 percent of the population, 21 percent, or maybe two percent of the population. Again, if 50 percent of the population earns 5 percent of the population earns 50 percent of the income, 50 percent of your growth is going to be appropriated by percent of your population your growth policy is an elite policy and we should also keep that in mind um, we should keep that in mind because we discussed growth as if everybody was getting simply the same and they may be getting simply the same in relative terms meaning that inequality is not changing but is that what we want we want to keep growing that way or when we discuss, okay, let's subsidize sector A, sector B, sector C in order to promote growth. Do we care about the results of this in terms of inequality? Do we have at least think about the results of it in terms of inequality? And the answer is that usually we do not. When we define like we fight inflation, I'm gonna combat inflation. Policies to combat inflation are gonna be X, A, B, and C. And what are the distributional impacts of those policies. We don't discuss that, and that should be discussed in my view. And uh, I say this because um, we should put pro poor growth in the agenda. We should discuss the appropriation of growth when we discuss growth. And it's, this in Brazil is gonna be particularly important because we're gonna begin very soon uh, uh, the debates on uh, you know, the elections and necessarily the implications of this for the next four, maybe five years of economic policy. And we are not actually discussing this very clearly. You know, everybody says, well, I care a lot about inequality, which means that, you know, I care a lot about inequality. Stop. Nobody's saying I care a lot about inequality and therefore I'm not gonna design a growth policy the same way I've been designed this for the last 20, 30 years, 100 years, whatever, maybe. 
Um, the implication is much more sophisticated than this and harder to solve, actually. The problem is much harder to solve than it seems. Um, yeah. Uh, if I want to summarize this, I would say that the most important question in political economy is who gets what. Like, you, when you take economy, economics 101, People are going to say, wow, the main questions are who, what to produce, how much to produce, blah, blah, blah. Right. You get, so, you know, that's, the, I don't think that's the, that's, those are the most important questions. The most important question is who gets what? Who pays for what, actually? Yeah, who, who gets what and who, who pays for what? It's a, the most important questions are distributional. Those are the classical questions on the political economy. And the most important question in the political economy. All the classic economists have gone through it and spent a lot of time there. And actually, non-classical economy, very important non-classical economists also have gone through it. And most of sociology of development has also tried to answer their questions to some extent and deal with, uh, dealt with, uh, with the same problem. So that's the way I would summarize this idea that we should be discussing the appropriation of growth, not only the level of growth. You know, who pays for it, who gets what? And that uh, that's also applies to all types of, of policies. So we have distribution, we have the concentration. Let me talk a little bit about mobility because mobility is what we want when we design policy. What is an anti-poverty policy? It's a mobility policy. You wanna get someone who's poor and move this person up so this person is no longer poor. So look, when we have policy in mind, we have mobility in mind, and we don't pay, pay much attention to mobility. We should be paying much more attention to mobility. Actually, we do pay attention to mobility, just don't name it mobility. But uh, mobility gives us a very good framework to understand what's going on. So what we have in Brazil in terms of mobility, we have lots of short distance mobility, which means that you are poor, you cross the poverty line, but you don't go way above it. You just go just a little bit above the, above the poverty line. That's short distance. Or you're rich and you become, you lose money, but you don't like become poor. You know, there's, you may have one episode of a person who was very rich and then suddenly is starving. You know, the next generation is starving, but it's almost unthinkable. You don't think of someone very rich and the next generation starving, except for disease or, you know, some very serious health problem or something like that, a you know, catastrophic event of that sense. But the regular course of life would imply that. The same way you don't think of anyone who was born and you know, almost starving and then suddenly moves out all the way up to the top of the distribution. Those are they, they exist, but they are extremely rare events. Most of the mobility you have are short distance mobility. And they are, most of the mobility in Brazil occurs at the bottom and at the top of the distribution. Someone rich become much richer, or someone Poor becomes, you know, you know, crosses the poverty line, becomes longer than poor, and and usually those movements are short. But we have lots of those movements. You know, it's not that Brazil doesn't have mobility; it has lots of mobility. It's just that mobility is very short. That also has implications, because uh, one of the implications of that is Brazil also has lots of vulnerability. People who are not poor. But because of mobility, they become poor. And then they exit poverty again, and they fall into poverty again, and they exit and fall and exit and fall. They keep going back and forth, up and down, and the distribution, which means above and below the poverty line. We, we, we name this vulnerability, but actually, this is just a type of mobility. It's a mobility at the bottom, and short distance mobility around the poverty line. What we call this vulnerability which means people are at risk. The idea of risk of falling to poverty is associated to the idea of vulnerability. And vulnerability is, is high. Brazil has lots of high levels of vulnerability. It's very hard to estimate that, but the estimates are that one in each half of, uh, of the lower half of the population will fall into poverty right, within a decade, you know, back and forth. They fall into poverty and then exit poverty within a decade. And implications of this were many, but one that is more obvious is that we designed our social protection systems 
to chronic poverty. You know, the idea, for instance, of cash transfers, of conditional cash transfers, the, the, the programs, the, the, the way you select the beneficiaries, the way you keep track of the beneficiaries, the way you, you make the transfers, you verify everything, you know, the entire infrastructure, let's say so, both organization and, and legal infrastructure of those programs, there are, the entire infrastructure is oriented to chronic poverty. Chronic poverty is, a, of course, an, obviously a very important problem, but it is not the only, the only problem we have to solve. The second problem we have to solve in the entire Latin American continent but, uh, is uh, vulnerability, is the possibility of falling into poverty. People who you would identify not as poor, statistically, for instance, so they would calculate a model and say, this person is going to be poor. Well, yes, not now, but because of vulnerability, people fluctuate up and, up and down. And remember, we're talking about a very large mass of people who are not poor, but very close to poverty. Remember, they're not, there's not much inequality. So even if you're not poor, it doesn't mean that you're completely protected from falling to poverty ever. There's a chance that you, you fall back in poverty. And also, this is something we should keep in mind when we design policy. I mean, the, the example of of conditional cash transfers is one that is easy to understand, but this has also implications for the way you design the entire protection system. Let me just, let me see if I'm gonna say this somewhere in education. All right, just one comment on our social protection system because I think this is of interest. We have a social protection system that is designed having a formal employment in mind. And that is a serious problem. Let me explain you why this is a serious problem. It fluctuates between 40 and 60%, but in practical terms, half of the Brazilian workers work in the informal sector. And being informal, essentially in our case, means you have no access to protection. You don't contribute to social protection, therefore you don't have any type of protection except the anti-poverty protection. Not having any type of protection means that you don't contribute to pensions, have no right to pensions. You don't contribute to social security in general, have no right to unemployment insurance, name it. Or, you know, if you lose your capacity to work, work accident, no access to pensions after that. That's problematic. And the problem has to do with the fact that we base our system on contributions on the payroll. And this extends to other types of inequality. I'm gonna mention this very briefly, but as, because we base the system on contributions to payrolls, if you are self-employed, you're not on the payroll. Or if you are employed, but, um, Informally, I mean, your, your employer does not contribute, does not pay shares on uh, the payroll. Means you're not protected. And why should we care about this? For many reasons. One of the reasons is that we're gonna solve this problem. If we don't protect people now, we're gonna have to solve this problem within two, three, four decades because these people will get old, they will need to retire, and they have no access to protection at all. So we have to think about solutions, even if not for justice reasons, we have to think about solutions because of fiscal reasons. Right. Or, of course, uh, well, one of to that. And uh, what is the problem of pensions based on payroll? Suppose, think of a grand, 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 grandmother. She couldn't work because women couldn't work. She was not an employee. And because she was not an employee, she had no access to protection. She could not divorce your grand, 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 grandfather because she would lose protection if she did so. Because, oh, no, there are survivor patients. Well, that doesn't solve the problem. Because you're forcing someone to be attached to another person forever because of the lack of protection. Why? Because we have designed the entire rules of all the rules in the labor market, or the, the labor laws, all the rules of uh, social protection based on a specific type of family, a specific conception of gender roles. 
And this has important implications. Women are discriminated on the labor market. Blacks are discriminated in the labor market. It means that they have lower wages. Because they have lower wages, they contribute less. Because they contribute less, they're going to get less protection in the future. What our social protection system does, because it's based on payroll contributions, it reproduces inequality between generations, reproduces the labor market in the pension systems. There are checks and balances, there are, there are caps and, and floors to avoid this. I'm not naive on this, but on gen, in general, that's what it does. Right? No one's going to do these things. All right, we have very high level of, of uh, concentration, very, a very unequal country, a very large mass of population that is very homogeneous, a small group that is very unequal. There's a lot of inequality within this group, and, but it's very rich. Money extremely concentrated at the top. Lots of mobility, but very short distance mobility. Lots of vulnerability due to that mobility. That's the, the scenario we're dealing with. Policies to, to face that. Policies to reduce inequality. Option number one, cash transfer. Is not option number two, education. Option number three, taxation. Let me go through one by one so you can understand what we have in front of us a little better. Cash transfers. Can we reduce inequality using cash transfers? Answer is no. Um, the effects of, in the, of cash transfers in inequality are very small. If you like, cash transfers would respond for about less minus five minus zero point five percent, less than one percent, a total inequality. It means that if you simply end both the familia and the DC programming. So an entire social system in Brazil tomorrow morning, the inequality is not going to bump more than 1%. The entire social system, zero. Well, if you, if you do the same with the direct taxes, direct taxes respond for minus 7% of total inequality, 14 times the weight on inequality that social systems has. And why? Because social assistance is very important to fight poverty, but fighting poverty, fighting inequality are two completely different things. Remember, highly concentrated at the top. Inequality, if you want to face, face the problem of poverty, you should look at the bottom of the distribution. But if you want to face the problem of inequality, you should look at the top of the distribution, look at the rich. Social assistance faces well the problem of poverty. It does not make a dent on inequality. Taxation, direct taxation, is very progressive, affects the top. Could be better, but affects the top and therefore has much more impact on inequality. Um, and not only has impact on inequality, and if you use the taxes wisely, you may not, because you can tax people a lot and just waste that money, or you, actually you can tax people progressively and, and spend that money regressively in the sense that you're going to give that money to the even more rich people than you're taxing. You can actually increase inequality by doing that. Uh, that doesn't happen, but you could, technically speaking, you could. So um, the lesson here is that, of course, we should look at taxes. They are very important, but taxes should be understood as a part of a system, the same way that the fiscal expenditures should be understood as a part of a system. Like you're taking money from one group and this redistributing or not that money. And that's that should remember the most important questions who gets what and who pays for what? Which means that we're dealing with the system. Second, education. Yes, uh, education is usually treated as one of the most important. Uh, policies that we could use to reduce inequality. That makes sense. Of course, if you educate lots of people, the tendency is that you're going to reduce inequality. But the question is not, okay, should we invest in education? How much education should we invest in? Should we be providing like basic education to everyone? Or should we be providing like secondary education? Or should it be universal education? 
Education is an important determinant for one type of inequality, wage inequality. Education, at least in theory, should not affect the distribution of uh, income, uh, capital uh, incomes. Technically speaking, it should be independent. It may have an indirect relationship because if, if you educate, you accumulate more, and therefore have more income. But that's 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 indirect. Directly speaking, it's it's a separate issue. Um, how much education should be investing on? Primary education does not make a dent in inequality. If you if you educate the entire labor for Brazilian labor force, a process that takes would would take around something maybe four decades, three decades to educate an entire labor force. Only with primary education, if you ensure that no one has less than primary education, uh, inequality wouldn't decline for more, by more than two percent, maybe three percent. That's not I mean given that you educate the entire population. If you give secondary education, same thing, four percent maybe. If you want to cross the barrier of less 10% of inequality, you have to massify university education. That is not cheap, that's not easy to do. Besides, it's going to take very long to do. But you have to massify if you want to cross the 10% barrier. If you want to cross the 20% less inequality, it means you're still not making Brazil and France in terms of inequality, but if you want to make Brazil get closer to France in terms of inequality, you would have to provide PhDs to the entire Brazilian population. <laughs> I don't think Finland is, has that in mind. So I don't think Brazil could barely think about that. And actually, we should have started that back in the 1950s. Because I come to the second point. Education is a very long-term investment. It takes very long to educate a person. How long does it take for you to get here? I mean, how long did it take? 12 years, 13 years, 18 years of education, so you can get here. 18. That's rounded to two decades. It took two decades for you to get here. So suppose that tomorrow morning, I make a perfect educational system in any Latin American country. It's going to, be, it's going to take two decades until the first wave of highly qualified students and cycle in this educational system there will be a tip in the labor market, a slice at the bottom of the labor market pyramid, because the majority of populations is still uneducated. It would take three decades, four decades for them to become a majority in the labor market. So effects of education are going to take very long to, to appear, and they will slowly get momentum until education really reduces in the quality. We're talking about decades and decades. Are we going to do, are we going to sit down and wait? So the answer is, okay, we can invest in education. I think we should invest in education. We should not expect too much from that. That's the point. And actually, uh, if you want to invest in education, uh, it has to be massification of university education, which is not realistic. It isn't going to be possible to do that so easily. It depends on a series of factors, but certainly it's going to cost a huge amount of money. But the costs of reducing inequality via education can be extremely high. What I want to make sure is that you understand that when we talk about education, we're not talking about basic education anymore, primary education. If we really want to tackle the problem of inequality, we must tackle the problem of massification of uh, higher education which is certainly not a simple problem. Taxation. Well, basically, you can divide taxes into consumption taxes, indirect taxes. And consumption taxes are the taxes you buy, you pay when you buy a bag of rice. Everybody pays more or less the same. Usually, everybody pays the same tax. Uh, rich or poor, they pay the same. Those taxes are, they tend to be slightly re regressive because the poor spend all the money buying things and the rich save part of the money. So all, not all the money is taxed by indirect taxes, but they're just slightly regressive. They're not very aggressive either. Essentially they're, let's understand them as being essentially neutral. 
which means that they don't affect inequality. Direct taxes are usually designed in a way that they are progressive. The richer you are, more taxes you pay. There are exceptions. In the case of Brazil, there's a very weird exception that you don't tax interest and dividends. Oh, profits and dividends. You don't tax profits and dividends and you tax uh, investment incomes less than you tax labor incomes. That is regressive, intrinsically regressive, because most of the capital is in the hand of a very small share of the population. Therefore, most of the capital gains, most of the returns from investments, most of the incomes coming from financial investment, everything is going to be highly concentrated. When you don't tax them or tax those incomes less than you tax the other incomes, of course, you're giving some, you're giving rich people a break. That's essentially what you're doing. That can be corrected. That's except for the political part of it, which is very hard, but technically speaking, that's not a problem to correct. It's easier to correct than, for instance, educating your entire labor force. That's a political decision. I'm not saying that's easy to do because there's a very important political decision. We're discussing a, a distributive conflict here. And it's not easy to, to win a distributive conflict, but it's different from education. Education, even if you make the decision tomorrow, is gonna to take four decades to get full results. Taxation, if you take a decision tomorrow, is going to take two years to get the results. Maybe well, a little bit more, maybe because of time that takes to adapt. But anyway, taxation of wealth that has always come to the debate. Taxation of wealth comes as either a panacea or as a taboo. A panacea is the idea that, oh, we're going to get so much money on that taxation that we don't have to worry about anything. So we have enough money to pay all the expenses we have. Certainly not true. Um, the possibility of a, of a uh, the fiscal space that generated by taxation wealth is not going to be that much. Uh, on the other hand, or you have the opposite side is saying, oh, no, this is a taboo. We shouldn't tax it. Well, let me explain one thing. Brazil already taxes wealth. It's called property taxes. You have a house, you pay taxes on that house. That's taxation of wealth. And 50% of all wealth is real estate in Brazil. All the declared wealth, the, the authorities, and so on, so forth. Maybe we cannot estimate that precisely, but 50% of taxes are. 50% of all wealth is already being taxed. So the question is that, should we tax wealth or not tax wealth? The question, the real question is, what, we do, what should we do with the other 50% and how should we tax them about this? Are we happy with the, the, the property taxes we have? I mean, are, are they well-designed? Certainly they're horrible. The data, property taxes take to, you can go back to property taxes a, a millennia at least. You wrote, I actually have them on two millennia. You have them on the Roman Empire. So a long way, you know, because it was easier to tax land, it was easier to tax uh, buildings, because you could see that. But now we have so much control of, uh, you know, flows of money back and forth. We have so much control of bank accounts and so on that maybe you should be discussing our taxation on wealth on different grounds. And why? Well, because if you design it well, you can design in a way that it's integrated with income taxes so that if people are able to evade income taxes, you're going to pay money on the property taxes, on the, on the wealth taxes. On the other hand, if they pay their income taxes, they're excused, like you, you generate a credit, they're excused from paying wealth taxes. And, and actually, it's, by doing so, we're making the, the taxation system more just. On the other hand, we're ensuring that we are you're, you know, collecting taxes from people who should be paying taxes. And we treat this as a taboo, but this should not be a taboo. There are ways to design it that can be, make it much better. I think there's a lot of, of room to improve, but that said, I don't think you can make any miracles on that. You know, the amount of, of uh, property declared to the tax authorities is about six times the amount of income of a, of a year. Of a year so it's a lot of money, six times, let's say, quote, 
six times the GDP, it's not the GDP, but six times the GDP of your country, but it's only six times of the GDP of your country. Right? It's not a huge, infinite amount of money can just uh, sap on that and take you know, an infinite space. There are limits to what you can do with taxation and so Well, so conclusion of this, cash transfers, very limited. Education has limitations. Taxation also has limitations. Should we do nothing then? And the answer is no. What is the main message I have here is that if you try to figure out what causes inequality, there's no single cause of inequality. It's not easy to make a, a very unequal country. It's a combination of things. And this combination of things uh, ha recently has a, is being called a chain of factors. It's not a single factor, it's a chain, a full chain of factors. A chain of factors requires a constellation of solutions. So the, the main message I have to bring here is that we're not discussing a huge uh, a problem that has a single cause or a simple cause or a simple set of causes. We're discussing a problem that has many different causes. And because this problem has many different causes, it can be addressed from many different angles. It can have many different solutions. And each solution is going to give us, uh, each cause is going to give a little contribution to total inequality. Each solution is going to give a little contribution to reduce inequality. Some of those little contributions to reduce inequality are going to operate in the short run. They're going to have short-term effects. Others are going to have long-run, long-term effects. Some are more risky. We expect them to, some are really risky. We expect them to work. Some are more risky. They may or may not work, like education. We don't know what's going to happen within four, four decades. So it's a high risk. Education is an investment of high risk. We don't know what society is going to do, what's going to do, what we're going to, we've, uh, we've produced lots of uh, Columbia uh, uh, masters. What we're going to do with them within four decades? Are going to be, they going to be used or not? Productive or productive or not? Lots of engineers. We're going to need engineers in the future. Lots of doctors. Are doctors going to exist? Well, maybe think of uh, you know telephone operators. Suppose that we had a, made a huge investment on telephone operators 20 years ago. They became completely useless today. So education is a high risk investment. We don't know much about the future, so we can make decisions on very solid grounds. <laughs> so conclusion is, if you have a chain of factors or constellation of causes, you need a constellation of solutions. That's the, the, the main message. Thank you. Thank you so much. So a lot of food for thought after this masterclass. And one of the things that we emphasize in this course is that uh, even though the main topic is Brazil, a lot of the, the situations that uh, Professor Valera described here can be applicable in several different contexts. And uh, I'm sure that some of you work more familiar with other countries might see some similarities to the situation that you find uh, over there. And before we get into the, uh, some comments, I would love to have Professor Carvalho to react to the, those initial remarks. Oh, great. So great pleasure to be here. Thank you, Sydney. And it's always, oh, sorry. It's always a, a pleasure to to listen to, to Marcelo. Sorry, uh, yeah, to turn it on. Yes, I'm going up. Okay. Hello? Right. Yeah. So it's always a pleasure to uh, to listen to, to Marcelo, who is one of the specialists uh, in this area in Brazil. I lived in Brazil most of my time, most of my life, and I always learn different things. So uh, as Sydney mentioned, I, I work, uh, I have two roles. I, I'm a professor at Federal University of Rio. So it's a public university. And I'm also uh, head of funding at the Brazilian Down Bank. So I basically in the bank, I implement some of these policies that Marcelo mentioned that are very important. And as a public institution, we basically uh, implement public policies. So we finance, uh, give credit to companies in education, health, uh, 
in basic infrastructure, so sanitation, so all the, if you go to Brazil in different regions, in different municipalities, you are going to see it in practice, uh, this huge, let's say, inequality that we have in our country. Uh, so whenever we basically are in Brazil, we're going to see, oh, we should invest in education, and it's going to have a huge impact. Uh, of course, the cash uh, transfer, the conditional cash transfer, like both familiar, huge impact. And in the tax reform, that's uh, probably the, on the short term, short horizon, uh, a huge impact. There is a lot of challenge, right? Political challenge. Uh, I, I have a, 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 an engineering degree and I also a law degree. And I remember one of my professors in the tax law, uh, I don't know if it's still valid, probably yes. He was telling at that time there were hundreds of different tax in Brazil, hundreds. Uh, in terms of laws, uh, like we have in the US, the federal laws, the state laws, the municipality laws, but if you add all the different tax that you have in Brazil, it's uh, hundreds. And it's very difficult to change it, right? Uh, in different perspectives, right? So my, my, my question to, to Marcelo, looking at uh, uh, being Brazilian, uh, and I used to say, uh, travel to many different countries and spend uh, part of my time abroad, but I, 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 I love my country and I wish we could at least uh, tackle this problem. In terms of the tax reform, Marcelo, uh, looking at the, the years ahead, um, uh, how, uh, what do you think about the possibility of uh, some of these guidelines that you mentioned to reduce this uh, inequality, how, how feasible they are uh, in, in, in any type of, let's say, new present that you may have, but you know that there is a, a huge obstacle, right, to implement, but at the same time, it's short, it's a short horizon uh, impact in terms of measure. So, any thoughts about uh, if you were the, uh, nominated to the minister to combat poverty and inequality in Brazil, what would be uh, your guidelines for our, let's say, political members? Yeah. Okay, just, yeah. yeah. The answer I don't know. <laughs> uh, I have an idea, at least. The thing is, technically speaking, uh, it's different from politically speaking. Technically, we know what to do. We know how to design a tax system. It may not be the perfect tax system, but we know how to improve the tax system radically. And actually, some of the decisions that we have to take are quite obvious from the point of view of sociology, point of view of economics. Like, uh, we can correct uh, some distortions in the tax system. That wouldn't be very hard to, to correct. The thing is that Okay, we all we may all agree on that. The, the problem is to make others agree on that because it touches on the distributive conflict. So let me give you an example, a very simple example of taxation, tax reform. Brazil has a, a taxes consumption the same way the US taxes, which is a very obsolete way. You tax the product, you don't tax the value added. Europe taxes the value added. Everybody agrees that taxing the value added is much better than taxing the, the sale. Right, so you don't if you like you tax step by step and not like the US, you take you to tax every sale. That's cumulative. That's bad. The best way of taxing is step by step. Everybody agrees on that. The, the thing is, why don't we change this? We don't change this because it has a federative impact. If you change the system, some states in Brazil are going to pay much more taxes. So other states are going to pay much less taxes, which means that companies are going to migrate. They're going to exit the states that pay more taxes. They're going to move to the states that are going to pay less taxes, pretty much like what happens in the US. So the problem is not a technical solution. The technical solution is very simple. We just, just switch from a sales tax to a, a, a aggregated value tax. The problem is how do you convince people in the Congress to do that? And the same goes for some, someone the other day asked me, why do we spend so much money on the military and not so much money on education? Because it makes much more sense. Well, the question is because there are a lot of things behind it as a political decision among others. Why do we waste so much money on things that are obviously nonsense? 
and we don't spend money on things that are obviously very important. For instance, why don't we invest more in vaccines? That's a question you can ask in the US. In Brazil, invests a lot of money in vaccines. But why didn't we vaccinate the entire population? Because it makes all the sense from the scientific and technical point of view. Well, that's one thing, but convincing people to get vaccinated, convincing mass vaccination, you know, mobilizing results for that is another story. Because if there's a, well, in the case of vaccines, it's a very silly conflict. But in terms of taxes and other things, it's, it's a real conflict in the sense that very clear winners and losers with, uh, you know, uh, losing money and uh, so they rationally trying to defend themselves so i do we have chances of making those things i don't know that's a, a political question and political questions are answered in the heat of the discussion you have no chances of making a reform and then something happens and then suddenly the political space opens and you take it what i know is that because politics works that way you have to be ready so when the chance comes, you take it. That's the thing. So there is a technical work that has to be done to get ready. And then it's just sit and wait for the opportunity. And then when the opportunity comes and then you take it. Uh, you make, you make like, you, you prepare the laws, you prepare everything, get ready to go, and then you go. I read all the, the presidential uh, speeches when each president took uh, Swore power and took power. I read all the speeches of, of Cardozo and Lula and others, and all of them proposed a pension reform, a tax reform. I forgot what else. I, I took note of this. I have to take to back my Labor reform. A labor reform. All of them proposed those things. We're going to do this. It is written. I mean, they said that. None of them did it. Why didn't do it? Uh, well, Cardozo tried, Lula tried to, a pension reform. Cardozo tried, Lula tried. Actually, Dilma tried, and no one made it because there was no political space to do that. And suddenly, Tamer had the, all the space to do it, and then something happened, he couldn't make it. I mean, most of the population was convinced that we should do things. We kind of agreed on, in the general terms of what we should be doing in the terms of a reform. Not everything, but the, the main lines, there was a, a general agreement. Even if people, politicians would come and say, I'm totally against it. Actually, they were for it. They're just saying that because they're have constituencies and they have not getting the political gains from from being opposition but actually they they supported it to somehow and then why didn't we make it and then suddenly comes bolsonaro which didn't have much support and did it because space was created political space was created just had to to take the chance so my position on this i cannot evaluate politics so well but I know that it depends on us having the plans prepared so we can take the chance. Mm -hmm. uh, before getting to the Q&A, uh, just a little bit, let's step back and talk about uh, Professor Fischler's seminal paper, Mark. Yeah. You, you mentioned him. Mm -hmm. The students uh, were asked to read the paper that Professor Fischler published at the AER, American mm -hmm. Public Review, in 1972. So we're completing this year, 50 years of that paper. And uh, one thing that we noticed it is that uh, there are a lot of things that have been kind of changed. Uh, Brazil was uh, one of the main findings of the of uh, Professor Fischler's research was that inequality was increasing despite the fact that the country was growing at nine percent a year. Brazil is under recession or is experiencing this uh, uh, moment of low growth, and still inequality is increasing. And it seemed that uh, uh, apart from very uh, specific moments in in uh, in Brazil's um, political life, so to say, uh, there is this inertia that is very hard for Brazil to overcome. Uh, looking back, based on uh, what we had, uh, what the data tells us, and looking ahead, where do you think the trend is gonna, is gonna to which direction the trend is gonna move? It is very hard to predict that what's gonna happen to inequality because you can't understand inequality as a distribution of growth. The dynamics of inequality, are the equivalent of the distribution of the dynamics of the distribution of growth, meaning that if a, the poor grow faster, inequality reduces. If the rich grow faster, inequality increases. So you, you can't understand, you can switch the, the, the trends of inequality to trends in growth of different groups. That's why I'm insisting that we should look at the growth appropriation. Uh, that, that's a, what we call the growth appropriation framework to inequality. 
we just understand the dynamics in terms of growth, differentiated growth. It is almost extremely hard to anticipate what's going to happen to growth in the country. Uh, if someone asked you in 2012, 2000, well, you take like the economist cover. What's going to happen to Brazil? Ah, it's going to blow. I know everything's going to be perfect. You see a bright future for the country. You would say that in 2012. You'd say that maybe in 2013. You wouldn't say that in 2015. And suddenly, come, the country goes into recession. So it's, it's a four year difference. It's hard to anticipate what's going to happen within four years. Now, think of this making your same predictions, not to the entire country, but to every single social class. It's very hard to, to predict what's going to happen to every social class within five years. So the answer is almost impossible to predict what's going to happen to inequality. All the, the attempts to predict it, unless they're very obvious, like predicting inequality of the next quarter from the previous quarter, which is doesn't give you much difference. So it's kind of a very simple thing because like, what's the population of Brazil within three months? Okay, that's kind of a inertia. But unless you're trying to do something like that, which is meaningless, uh, every attempt to predict inequality with a year of anticipation that I know has failed. If, if, if it didn't fail, it was mere coincidence. Because if you keep trying one day, you're going to get it. But uh, it was pale, and it was it had no grounds. It was just a projection of a trend of the past that, of course, can change if the country goes through a recession and so on. Oh, fantastic. So uh, we're closing the public part of our class. We appreciate the participation of our audience online. And now we're going to start the second part where students are going to participate in the discussion. So Anna, thanks again, and we're closing the transmission now. Thank you.